We're continuing in our quest to figure out if Malazan is for you or not. It's a 10 book series, there's a huge fan base, but it can be a bit tough to get into. It's like the Dark Souls of fantasy series. The entry point is high, but once you get into it, it's supposed to be quite rewarding. By the way, I say Malazan because that's what the audiobook says, but I heard Steven Erickson say Malazan. So for all the Malazan scholars out there, I'm assuming either is correct, but I'll probably say Malazan throughout this video. Basically all my pronunciations are going to be from the audiobook. Anyway, there are 10 books and the first book was 225,000 words or so, and this one is almost 300,000 words but it feels even more because these books are incredibly dense. There's almost no idle moments, always something is happening. In my Gardens of the Moon video, I said you should definitely read it and I gave you a lot of tips to help you get through that book. I'll link that video in the description if you'd like to check that out. But the answer is a bit difficult for this one. So we're going to go through a numbered list, talk about all aspects of this book to decide if you should continue reading Malazan Book of the Fallen. For those of you looking for a quick answer, what I can say is I will continue reading the series. Strangely enough, there is not going to be any major spoilers for Gardens of the Moon in this video. So this video is for people who have read the Gardens of the Moon, people who started the Gardens of the Moon and stopped, and for people who never read the Gardens of the Moon. There are a couple of reasons why there are no spoilers for the first book. The first reason is these books are very difficult to spoil. They're not very twisty, like A Song of Ice and Fire, for example. Even if I told you a major spoiler, like who lives and who dies, it still wouldn't make a huge difference for your reading experience. These books are all about the journey. Even if I gave you a list of all the encounters the characters have, it still wouldn't spoil the book because it's all about discovering those things with the characters. But the real reason I can't spoil is the first point we'll talk about this book, and that is the characters. In epic fantasy, the first book can have a lot of information in it. You meet the characters, you meet the world, but once you get used to all of these, in the second book you can completely focus on the story. Not for Malazan! Do you remember how there were like 30 characters in the first book? And there were even viewpoints of weird creatures? Like there was a crow or something? Well, forget about all of them and get ready to meet a completely new set of characters. Yep. The first book takes place in Genabakis, whereas this book takes place in seven cities, which is a completely different part of the world. So get ready to meet a complete new set of characters. The positive news is though, there are way fewer viewpoints. The only viewpoints you get are of the main characters. Maybe there's an occasional viewpoint from a random character, but very few, if any. The chapters are organized similar to the first book. So you have a chapter and many sections within the chapter for each separate viewpoints. They are still not labeled by character name, but the improvement is that you get the name of the viewpoint character very early in the section. In the first book, sometimes it would hold it back until the end of the section, but usually it would hold it back at least for a few pages. And it was exhausting to figure out which viewpoint you were in, especially because there were so many minor viewpoints. But all of this is gone in this book. It's far easier to follow. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of personality in the different viewpoints. There's still a very strong narrator voice in this book. All the characters perceive and describe the world in a similar way. The personality is usually given in direct thoughts. Those are written in italics. If you read Dune, it's very similar to that. I will still say characters are the weakest point of the series. If you are a heavily character-driven reader, this series is probably not for you. And it's not that the characters aren't interesting, they're very interesting, but the writing style is just too distant. It's very difficult to form connection to the characters. Although compared to the first book, I definitely cared far more about the characters. I did find myself caring about what happened to them, which wasn't something I had in the first book. As we have a definitive set of characters to follow in this book, we also have clear goals for each character. So the second point we'll talk about is the story. The general story of the second book is similar to the first book in the sense that the Malazan Empire is trying to conquer the world. But this book gives a lot of Malazan Empire viewpoints. So the lines between good and evil are seriously blurred. At this point, it's really hard to talk about any heroes and villains in 
in the series. In the first book, the Malazan Empire was having trouble taking an important city, the Rujistan. But in this one, it's like a whole continent. The seven cities is giving them a very difficult time. There is a rogue fist of the empire and his army fighting on the side of the seven cities. Their leader is Shaikh and she is supposed to unleash this powerful force. That's the general story going on. Then we have group of characters and each group has a certain goal. The first group is a bunch of slaves. Felicin used to be noble. Her sister became the adjunct to the empress and Felicin ended up a slave. She has two companions, Borik, who is a priest, and Bodan, who is a warrior. Felicin wants to take revenge from her sister, who is responsible for her ending up being a slave. The other group is the imperial historian Diker and Fist Coltane. They're trying to get thousands of refugees from Hisar to Aran. That's a huge journey and they have to overcome the rogue Fist Corbolo Dome's armies on the way. For me, this is the strongest story arc in this book. It's a complete arc, so it's kind of like a full book within this book. It's still connected to the rest of the story though. The third group is Mapo and Ikarium. Ikarium is this legendary warrior, but he lost his memory. And Mapo is his guardian. They're traveling to find Ikarium's memories. They have a very strong friendship. And the storyline is mostly about their friendship. And the final group is actually a group of characters we know from the first book. It's Kalam, Fiddler, Crocus, and Absalar. They're taking Absalar back to her father. Kalam wants to kill the Empress, so he has a different motivation. Unfortunately, I was sad to see Crocus Absalar relationship so weak. Strangely enough, I had particularly liked Crocus in the first book. He had felt the most human among all the characters. But in this book, he's pretty weak. Same for Absalar, she had such an interesting arc in the first book, and in this one, she barely exists. Now, some of these groups converge as the story progresses, and some of these separate, so I'm not going to go into that, but things do evolve. In that regard, I can say the story is far easier to follow compared to the first book, but you need to get through the first 30%. The first 30% is you getting introduced to the whole cast of the characters, unfortunately. You need to go through that again, but the good news is that it's much more organized than the first book. The characters are traveling this completely new part of the world, which brings us to the final point and the strongest trait of the series, world building. Just like in the first book, this book is all about world building. This series is really about the story of this world. In a lot of books, there is usually something small and personal happening and the world building sort of like the tip of the iceberg with the rest of the iceberg feels like it exists. Not in Malazan. In this book, you get the whole damn iceberg. It's incredibly detailed, all sorts of cultures and races and species and cities and creatures and magic. Actually, I want to open a parent this is here, I want to help you out about something that confused me a lot. There are two types of creatures called a soul taken and a divers. These creatures are shapeshifters. A soul taken can turn into a single creature like a bear, while a divers can turn into multiple creatures like a group of rats. This confused me a lot. They would be like, no, a dragon, it's a soul taken. And I thought a soul taken was a type of dragon or a lizard or a bear. Then at some point I realized what it was and that point was halfway into the book. So hopefully this will help you and you won't have the same thing. But if I still got it wrong, let me know. Anyway, back to the world building. The events taking place are world changing. You're witnessing a very important event in this whole world's history. It affects everyone, it is big. That's another reason why I made a Dark Souls analogy in the beginning because you can explore the dark Dark Souls world for hours and hours and it's huge. There are tons of stories you can find in the world. Same with this book, it's incredibly dense. The events have remarkable effect on everyone living in this world. If that's the kind of storytelling you're looking for, this book is a rare gem. I can't really think of anything else quite like this book. One incredibly annoying thing for me that keeps happening in the series is characters having visions. That's such a shitty plot device, it drives me insane. Having visions solves a lot of problems. Suddenly out of nowhere someone starts having visions. This happened in the first book too, but in this one a lot of major plot developments happen because someone suddenly starts having visions. I just can't accept it and I cannot get over it. It's something I particularly dislike. And in this book, it happens a lot. The Chain of Dogs story arc, which is Diker and Coltane's storyline, is very emotional, but I didn't like how it was wrapped up. 
I'm not going to say more because I don't want to spoil, but that storyline deserved better. If I had been satisfied with the ending of that storyline, I'd probably have given this book an extra star. That was like the defining arc for me because I was really invested in it. I generally was not satisfied with the endings of any of the arcs in this book. Obviously there are eight more books, so it's understandable why most arcs weren't resolved. But the ones that were resolved were also not satisfying for me. But I will continue reading this. I have high expectations from Memories of Ice. It's a lot of people's favorite book in this series. If I want to rank the characters from this book to manage expectations for the next book, I would say I don't care about Felicin at all. I guess Boric is kind of interesting. I don't care about Fiddler. I don't care about Crocus and Absalar anymore. I guess Kalam is alright. I am interested in seeing more Ikarium and Mapo. My favorite characters in this one were Diker and Coltane. I'm hoping to make more Malazan videos because there's so much to talk about, but also it takes so much time. So if you don't want to miss them, don't forget to subscribe. There are also all sorts of other bookish videos on this channel. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like to let me know. And if you have read this book or this series let me know your thoughts and i'll see you next time goose